So that was Romance Studies? Perhaps. At the outset of this course, my minimal promise was that we would be engaging with a series of interesting and challenging texts. And our first aim was to figure out strategies to read them well and to expand our horizons through this exploration of new texts, new readings. I'm happy enough that we've accomplished this, and you should be too. You may never in your life read another Chilean, Brazilian, Romanian or Catalan novel, but you now have some clues as to how to tackle them if you do. Some of the books we've read have been difficult, but I hope that difficulty will no longer put you off. I'm not sure what your initial expectations were for this course, or for the text that we have read. You may want to refresh your memory as to what you wrote down in answer to my question when we were reading Proust. But those expectations may well have changed, and I hope that you now expect more of yourself too. Moreover, you have concepts, modernism, realism, trauma, translation, dialogism, affect and abjection, but also many, many others, that you can put to use in further expanding your horizons, in whatever direction you choose. In some ways we've only skimmed surfaces, but we've also learned to defend superficiality where necessary. What you do with all this is up to you. You too are tasked with inventing romance studies. Our second aim was to trace patterns of commonality and difference between the texts that we read. We could think about patterns of either form or content. There have been a plethora of first-person narrators, for instance. What are the effects of that narrative style, and how has it been deployed, perhaps to different ends? As for themes, we've read, for instance, many books about memory, history, violence, politics, gender, education, the real. But you may have, may have been drawn to other recurring topics, reflecting your own interests and concerns. Motherhood, travel, technology, food and drink. Pause the video and think back. What patterns have you seen? Could you group the texts according to their different approaches or obsessions? What common problems do they identify? What common blind spots do they exhibit? Do they constitute a tradition of any sort? Or is every text that we've read truly singular, absolutely distinct? Write down some thoughts. While you do that, I'll have a beer. But I'll be right back. There are no right answers here. In some ways, texts, like people or families or cities or countries or anything else, are singularities. Abstraction, required even to talk about them, let alone to compare them, inflicts a form of violence. Hence our stress has been on close reading, looking for and respecting the details that make each of these novels different and distinct. Insofar as we detect more general patterns, often that says more about us than it says about the books we've re been reading. Every text is a Rorsak test on which we project our own individual or social anxieties and desires, whether we know it or not. But it is this that enables us to talk about them, as literature becomes a catalyst for the exploration of a shared political unconscious. One theme that has been central to many of the texts we've read has been childhood, or the transition from childhood to adulthood. In diverse contexts, from fin de siècle France, with Proust, 
to early 20th century Martinique with Zobel, Franco Spain, La Forette, wartime Vichy, Perec, or post war Italy, Ferrante. We've seen narratives, sometimes semi autobiographical, and often from a child's perspective, of a young person's endeavour to decipher and then adapt to the adult world around them. At the same time, as growing up both opens up new horizons and places new obstacles in their way. The fact that this theme has recurred so often is somewhat happenstance. A different selection of texts may have yielded other repeated motifs. But on the other hand, childhood is a common enough setting for fiction, and the passage from youth to maturity offers a ready-made plot structure, so much so that there is an entire genre the Buildings Roman, to encompass such coming-of-age stories. Children inhabit a world that is like our own, but not quite, that is familiar but also distant, and the process by which we leave that environment often involves both the ritual, the ceremonies that in many cultures accompany becoming a man or a woman, and storytelling. There's something traumatic about achieving maturity that seems to call for narrative, for a tale to be told that would justify and explain that transition. In returning to such crucial narratives, these novels inevitably also question them, by revisiting the trauma that coming-of-age stories both conceal and preserve. By extension, they may make us think about other narratives of development too, in which the present is framed as the natural but superior outgrowth of a now distant and outmoded past. Turning to childhood, and specifically to a child's perspective on the adult world, is also a prime mode of defamiliarization. It enables an account of social practices in which not everything is taken for granted. The perplexity with which children sometimes react when they learn the way things are, the toddler's incessant question, why, reminds us that adults do not always have good answers, and that another world is possible, even if our capacities to imagine that otherness have been dulled over time. Defamiliarization is also defamilization a break from the intimate but also social structures that we all inhabit. A child's voice can militate against habit, against the habituation that ensures that the arbitrary workings of power go without saying, are so naturalised that they can almost seem invisible. Indeed, even without knowing it, a child's perspective can make the unseen visible, registering what otherwise goes without comment enabling what French philosopher Jacques Rancière would term a new distribution of the sensible, that implicitly questions why some things, some viewpoints, some people count and are recorded, while others are not. By revisiting narratives of development and by defamiliarizing our sense of the world around us, Many of these novels also both partake in and subvert an account of social and aesthetic history in terms of modernity and postmodernity. These categories have helped to structure this course. We began with a discussion of modernism and the modern novel in Proust, but also Aragon and Bombal. And we moved later to an assessment of the postmodern, explicitly with Perec and implicitly, for instance, with Bolaño and Cercas, and the games their texts play with truth and fiction, referentiality and the real. We confirmed a more or less linear narrative in which 19th century realism is replaced by a variety of experiments with multiple perspectives, reframings and self-referentiality, self followed by a return of the real in mid-century, Moravia, Sagan, Rodoreda, before the still more radical decentering and uncertainty evident in Lispector 
or in different ways, fuentes or mania. Yet that linearity breaks down as the priority of the present over the past, or alternatively, the determination of present by the past, is questioned and even overthrown in texts as varied as those by Bombal, Zobel, or Agualusa, for whom the more pertinent opposition might be the spatial hierarchy between centre and periphery, which they also propose to challenge and dispute. I emphasize the many ways in which these texts feature children who turn against their elders, sometimes tragically, as in Sagan, at other times futilely, as in Bolaño, or in which they challenge the past, and even the very notion of pastness, to highlight another theme that runs through them, to which I pointed at the outset, betrayal. All these texts, in one way or another, turn against tradition. From Proust and Aragon to Ferrante and Agualusa, they manifest a drive to innovate, to do things differently, to start again, to rewrite the rules. If they turn to the past, this is to mark their difference and distance from it, to rewrite history and not to repeat it. Whether they succeed in this or not, and they are often realistic or disenchanted about the hold that the past still has on the present, something always escapes. This in the end is what literature does. Even as it takes on old forms, established genres, such as the novel itself, and as it alludes to or quotes from previous texts, as it invariably must, a literary text always seeks the limits of language, to trace the shifting frontier between what can and cannot be said, between the sayable and the unsayable. Literature betrays tradition also in the second sense of that word, in that each text discloses or reveals something about the discourses against which it rebels, if only by showing that things could have been said otherwise that there is nothing natural or preordained about the relationship between words and things. If the hallmark of literary representation is that it is an unfaithful representation of the real, then perhaps the most literary texts are those that betray, again, disclose or let slip, that infidelity, even as they indulge in it themselves. There is something slippery and excessive about all the texts that we have read. They are slippery in that they cannot fully be trusted. They do not exactly fit within the moulds that we may have prepared for them. They cannot exactly be grasped or pinned down. It is not that they are hiding anything, that they seem to be saying one thing but are in fact saying another. There is no secret key to their true meaning. It is that they are always on the move, that they exceed their original contexts while their meanings multiply and change in the new contexts in which we read them, but also that they move us in different ways, depending on our own contexts and experiences. This is why we keep reading them. They open up a world of difference. What then of romance studies as a frame or mould? The novels we have read transgress the boundaries of the romance languages as much as they make a mockery of any notion of a romance world. They pick up on, reflect, and turn against multiple traditions. Proust, Aragon and Bombal, for instance, are in dialogue with an international modernism that is not confined simply to French or Spanish. Equally, Lispector's Cockroach is a remaking of Kafka's. Fuentes' narrative crisscrosses the US-Mexico border, and Agualusa shows the way national narratives are stoked or shaped by global conflicts. 
A focus on Romance language texts may reveal different facets to globalization. It is not all Microsoft and McDonald's, but is no less global for all that. At the same time, we have seen plenty of heterogeneity, even within this chosen frame. What if anything brings together, say, Aragon's Paris with Roderader's Barcelona or Mania's Bucharest? It would be simplistic to claim that there is some kind of romance culture that can be identified and disentangled from the global forces, modernization, fascism, totalitarianism, that shape these three European cities, let alone from the still broader movements of capitalism, colonialism and revolution that shape Bombal's Chile, Zobel's Martinique or Fuentes's Mexico. Any account of Romance studies must fit within these larger geographies and histories, rather than pretending that there is something resistant to some notional Anglo-American hegemony in the mistaken idea of a Romance world. At its best, Romance studies might trace the fate and potential of minor literatures. For Gilles Deleuze and Felix Guattari, a minor literature doesn't come from a minor language. It is rather that which a minority constructs within a major language. And while there is no doubt that French, Spanish, Portuguese and so on are major languages in Deleuze and Guattari's sense, languages of empire principally, which explains their global spread, but also languages of governance and rule in individual nation-states, and not only France, Spain and Portugal. Still, within a global context they are increasingly minor, no matter how many millions of speakers and learners they may have. In the global distribution of power and knowledge, more and more it is only English that counts, and even languages such as French or Spanish are relegated to conveying cultural particularity, rather than being seen as vehicles for thought. Moreover, that particularity is to be translated into English for it to become intelligible, comparable, quantifiable. It is above all as literature in translation then, either in fact or in potential, that Romance literatures becomes minor literature a vector of deterritorialization, flight and betrayal no longer relative only to the classical paradigm of Latin and Greek, but also to the global monolingualism for which world literature can come into being only in English. The three characteristics of minor literature, Deleuze and Guattari tell us, are the deterritorialization of language, the connection of the individual to a political immediacy and the collective assemblage of enunciation. We might as well say that minor no longer designates specific literatures, but the revolutionary conditions for every literature within the heart of what is called great or established literature. We have seen these characteristics in the novels we have read, though we might add that they are often better characterized as what Alberto Moreras calls infra-political rather than political, in that they concern the conditions of possibility for politics per se, as much as for revolution, or rather the conditions of possibility for a revolution that might be an escape or flight from the political, as it is currently constituted. The collectivities that they imagine, their collective assemblages of enunciation, bring together diverse materials and bodies, human and non-human, animal and other, from a madeleine to a trench coat, a lobster to a cockroach, a cup of tea to a pint of beer. Romance studies would be, would be about inventing new assemblages, new concepts of this minor literature, to escape the deadening homogenization of bureaucratic reason.